All right. Uh, why don't we uh, Why don't we get started here? Things are slowing down a little bit. I expect we'll get quite a few other people joining us as we get started here, but we've got a lot of ground to cover. So why don't we get started? First off, I wanted to welcome uh, everyone to today's panel on the Copyright Claims Board. Uh, I am Keith Cooperschmidt, the CEO of the Copyright Alliance, and I will be moderating today's session. Uh, today, with the help of some really terrific panelists, we're going to address a number of important issues and questions relating to the Small Claims Court, which is called the Copyright Claims Board, or the CCB for short, you'll hear us referencing it as the CCB. During our panel discussion, we hope to provide you, the attendees, with the information that you'll need to know to bring cases or defend cases before the CCB. And what we'll do to do that, we'll uh, start the panel discussion by touching on the most significant features of the CCB. Then the panel will walk attendees through each step of the CCB process, first beginning with the filing of a case, and then we'll touch on the respondent's decision whether to opt out or not, and you'll understand what we mean by that a little bit later. Uh, after that, we'll discuss what take, takes place during an active proceeding, and then of course, the final decision itself by the CCB. Then anything else doesn't fit squarely or neatly into one of those categories, we will cover in sort of a potluck session uh, section at the very end of the, 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 the panel discussion. And then if we have time permitting, we'll, we'll have a Q&A session at the very end. Um, I want to uh, note that we just found out that the last batch of final rules are set to be issued by the Copyright Office tomorrow. Uh, and so as a result, I'll kind of leave it up to our panelists how much detail they want to go and get into with these new rules. Um, uh, and, uh, but hopefully we can provide you with some information that will be sort of official as of tomorrow. Uh, and before we begin the discussion, I want to make sure I thank our, our, our three sponsors, the Texas Accountants and Lawyers for the Arts, the American Society of Media Photographers, or ASMP, and of course, my organization, the Copyright Alliance. And I also want to thank all the uh, attendees for joining. If you have any questions for the panelists while you're listening today, please put them in the chat section, which you'll find at the very bottom of the screen. And then if we have time at the end, we'll hopefully we have, have a chance to take you know, a, few, a few questions that, uh, that, that come up. So with that, uh, let me kick things off by introducing our esteemed panelists and asking them to say a little bit about themselves. First, we'll start with David Carson. David is the Cop A Copyright Claims Officer at the US Copyright Office. David, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and also what a CCB officer does? Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, well, I've been practicing copyright law for over 40 years, hard to believe, but uh, not enough to let me call myself an expert, but I can at least call myself a specialist. Um, started out as a copyright litigator, first in LA and then in New York for about 15 years. Then I came to the Copyright Office as general counsel in 1997, stayed there for seven or for 15 years, uh, spent a couple years in London working for the recording industry, and then came back to government, where I spent seven years as the head of the copyright policy team at the Patent and Trademark Office, and then returned to the Copyright Office last summer uh, as the first member of the Copyright Claims Board, and I've been joined by two others, Brad Newberg and Monica McCabe. Copyright claims officers are the people who preside over proceedings that are filed in the Copyright Claims Board. Uh, small copyright claims. Uh, you'll hear more about that, so I'm not going to talk any more about what they, they consist of. You'll hear plenty about that for the rest of the, this meeting. Uh, so we're the people sort of uh, the final decision makers. We've had a lot to do with the construction of the rules and so on, and we're assisted by a very able team, one of whom is here with us, and you'll meet her in a moment. All right, that's a perfect segue for me to introduce Whitney uh, Lewandowski, who is the Supervisory Copyright Claims Attorney. So Whitney, maybe you can also tell us a little bit about your background and also what a CCB attorney does. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us uh, this afternoon, uh, Keith. And uh, thank you to our co-hosts, ASMP and uh, Tala. Um, I will just say I come from a background of public information and education about copyright law. Um, I've kind of traditionally found my job to be talking about copyright law to anyone, anywhere, whoever wants to hear it. Um, and that means I've had a lot of experience talking to people with a lot of copyright experience. 
and very little copyright experience, people who are just coming to the subject matter. And um, so I joined the Copyright Claims Board because I see that as a continuation, see the board as a continuation of my work to help people know about copyright law and how to resolve copyright disputes. Um, <clears throat> so I serve as the supervisory copyright claims attorney. Um, I have two colleagues, Maya Burchette and Dan Booth. Uh, they are both copyright claims attorneys, and we are your first line of response uh, of information. Um, so we are going to talk a lot about the resources that the CCB has uh, for participants, but know that there are also people, the copyright claims attorneys, um, who will play a role throughout the proceeding to help people understand copyright law and making the best case before the CCB. All right. Thank you very much, Whitney. As you can tell already, we have an all-star team here. Uh, so let me let me introduce the rest of the all stars here. Tom Madry. Uh, Tom is the general counsel and head of national content and education for ASMP. Uh, Tom, why don't you tell us about your background and also about ASMP? Yeah, thank you, Keith. And and let me say just how excited I am to, to have David and Whitney here as well as yourself and Terika. Um, uh, ASMP. Uh, has been around since 1944 and uh, is one of the largest and oldest uh, commercial photography trade associations in the world. We focus on advocacy efforts, uh, both judicially and, and in Congress, uh, but our main focus is to help the smallest of small creators, whether they're photographers, filmmakers, videographers, any kind of content creator, understand uh, copyright, understand the business, um, of, of the creative fields. And uh, um, I'm, I'm certainly proud to be part of ASMP. I also um, uh, am very honored to sit on the board of TALA, the Texas Accountants and Lawyers for the Arts. Uh, I'm here in Dallas, Texas. And TALA was formed in 1979 to provide pro bono legal services, both in, uh, in, in the legal world and in the accounting world to the arts. Uh, and so uh, we work with a lot of uh, performing arts groups and visual arts groups and creators of all types, all of whom are, are very excited about the CCB um, uh, as, as ASMP is. Uh, this has been a, a legislative and advocacy priority for ASMP for, for probably close to a decade. Um, and uh, when it was signed into law, the Case Act was signed into law and, and uh, we got the ball rolling here, uh, it was one of the biggest victories for, for the smallest of creators. And I'm so uh, so proud to be on this panel and with this group. All right, thanks, Tom. And our final panelist uh, is Terika Carrington. Terika is the Vice President of Legal Policy and Copyright Council here at the Copyright Alliance. Uh, Terika, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little background and about yourself and about the Copyright Alliance, and then maybe if you can say a few words about what the CCB is and why it was created. I mean, Tom touched on that a little bit, maybe you have a little bit to add. Yeah, thanks, Keith. So just first of all, I just wanna thank everyone for joining us, all of our attendees, and also uh, thank you to all the sponsors for having us as panelists here to talk about the Copyright Claims Board. I know it's something that we're all very excited about. Um, as Keith mentioned, I am VP of Legal Policy at the Copyright Alliance, which is an advocacy organization that advocates for the rights of creators all across the spectrum of copyright. So pretty much any kind of creator that you can think of, uh, you can find within our membership. Um, and personally, over the last several years, working on advocacy related to getting the Case Act passed um, has been a big part of my job at the Copyright Alliance. And of course, more recently, we've kind of switched gears now that the Case Act has passed to helping our individual creator members in particular become prepared for and understand, be, be educated about the Copyright Claims Board itself. So, you know, before we get into a bit more of a deep dive about what to expect, I'll just give a quick overview of the Copyright Claims Board or the CCB as we'll be referring to it throughout uh, today's program. But this is a small claims uh, alternative that was created to be an alternative to federal court for certain types of copyright claims. Um, in federal court, it can cost around half a million dollars to litigate a copyright infringement case uh, from start to finish, which is far too expensive for most individuals and small businesses. So the CCB was created to be an affordable alternative to federal court to provide much needed access to justice. And so we'll get into some more details about what exactly that means, but I thought that would be just a, a nice overview to get started. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Keith. All right, thanks, Terrica. So as we said, we're gonna do this thing step by step, talk about filing a case all the way to the decision. 
before we do that though, before we do this deep, deep dive, let's, I'm gonna ask the panelists to look at things more broadly at the CCB, right? So I'd like each of our panelists uh, to name one key feature you think is worth highlighting uh, about the CCB. I'm gonna ask David, why don't you go first, if you don't mind? Oh, we can't, David, you're on mute. I was on mute, very sorry. Uh, one key feature of the CCB is that our process is relatively simple and streamlined. I say relatively because we're comparing it to a court. Uh, we certainly had plenty of people commenting on our proposed rules that they were incredibly complicated and we tried to simplify them, but um, there are rules because you have to have rules. So we'll operate more or less like a court, but with much less process and in a way that's perhaps halfway between what your experience in most courts would be and what your experience in a local small claims court would be. Basically, everything's done online. Like courts, we have discovery, which is a process in which the parties exchange information about the facts relating to the case. In federal court, it's probably the most time consuming and expensive part of litigation in the United States, but it's quite limited before the board. Uh, testimony will be presented in writing and we may or may not have a hearing. We'll then issue a decision, which will explain who won the case and if the claimant won, how much the respondent will have to pay the claimant, assuming there is a, a monetary award and it'll explain the reasons for our ruling. And that's it in a nutshell. Okay, great. Who wants to go next here? Well, I'll jump in and, and talk about one of the great features uh, of, of the CCB is that it's inexpensive. And by being inexpensive, it's accessible to, to uh, small creators, individual creators. You know, even though the, the, the CCB offices are at the U.S. Copyright Office, as, as David just said, um, it's, uh, uh, you do not have to travel there. You can participate electronically and remotely wherever you are. Uh, that's a, a great benefit. You know, another thing that um, that that we fought for at ASMP was was something that was implemented uh, on the filing fees and that this two tiered pricing system. Um, the filing fees are are so much lower, and you have the ability um, to to not pay the even low amount all at once uh, uh, with this two tiered system. And and then finally, as Tarek was saying. You know, when you when you bring a, a copyright infringement case in federal court, it can be up to half a million dollars. This, the inexpensive nature of this, the the way the CCB is designed uh, to allow individuals to bring these matters uh, is really a victory. It's one of the best parts, in our opinion. Yeah, and I'll I'll just chime in next. Um, you know, as David and and Terica outlined, uh, federal litigation can be complex and time consuming process. Uh, to navigate the system, you know, people often turn to attorneys. Uh, so what I'm really excited by is the CCB's ability and structure uh, for goal towards accessibility um, so that you can uh, go through a CCB proceeding without an attorney. Um, you know, with attorneys in federal litigation, they need to make specific legal arguments, provide strategy, and it adds to the overall expense. Um, when we were developing procedures, we focused on establishing a process that can be navigated by non-lawyers, and we want to provide a variety of resources to help participants make their best case before the CCB. And now we do recognize that uh, participants may still want to seek legal counsel or, or advice on particular matters with the CCB. And uh, the statute gives us um, the authorization for supervised uh, law students to represent pr participants in CCB proceedings. So one thing that we are working on uh, to make the CCB pro broadly accessible is a directory of legal clinics and pro bono organizations uh, that are available to take CCB clients. Uh, so we are working on building that right now and we're really excited to provide that resource to people as we um, on, uh, roll out. And so I'll go ahead and jump in uh, with one other thing that I think is important just to kind of highlight at the outset which is that the process is entirely voluntary. Um, and what I mean by that is not only is it voluntary in the sense that a claimant has the ability to decide whether or not they wanna to go to federal court or they wanna to go to the CCB. So even if they have a claim that is small enough to bring to the CCB, they still have the option to bring that case to federal court if they can afford to do so. So it's voluntary from the perspective of the claimant, but it's also voluntary for the respondent. And the respondent is similar to like a defendant uh, in federal court. 
Uh, and so the, the respondent has the ability to decide whether or not they want to participate in a claim that's brought against them and they can choose to opt out if they don't want to participate. Um, and you know, a, a lot of people wonder, you know, well, why is that the case? Why is it voluntary? Why is it not required like federal court? And the reason for that is it goes back to the constitution. Um, there are constitutional requirements that have to be met. Um, you know, people have a right to be able to have their copyright claims heard in an Article Three court, which is a federal court. Uh, they have the right to be able to have a jury trial. And so in order to have your case heard uh, before the CCB, the respondent actually has to waive those rights. And so for that reason, it actually does have to be voluntary in order to uh, comply with the requirements of the constitution. All right, thank you, Terika. So one, one thing I'm gonna take a little moderator prerogative here, I'm gonna add to everything. Um, uh, this is a small claims court after all, right? So one of the things that highlights for me is the remedies um, is that there are damage caps to make sure it is sort of a small claims court. So, so that damages could not exceed $30,000 in total damages uh, for a case that you bring before the CCB or $15,000 limit for in statutory damages for one claim. So there are lim monetary limitations that you, you sh should be aware of uh, if you're thinking about uh, filing a claim. And the other thing is that there are no injunctions. If you go to federal court, you might be able to get an injunction in other words, to get somebody to stop what they're doing, basically. Um, there's a, a sort of something we'll, we'll talk about later, uh, similar to an injunction, but there are no formal injunctions. So, okay, so let's, let's, let's move on to kind of our first step in the process, which is filing a case. Um, uh, before we do that, we're gonna do that with each kind of big chunk of the CCB we take on. There are certain terms that you're gonna need to know, some of which we've already kind of mentioned in our, in our overview here. Uh, but we wanna make sure everyone, we're not, we don't wanna lose anyone. We wanna make sure everyone's on the same page here and to make sure everyone understands the terms that we're using. So I'm gonna call on Tom at first here in sort of like a speed dating type approach to ask him to explain very quickly uh, some of these terms. So, so Tom, first, let's discuss how we refer to the parties in a CCB case. So who is a claimant, who is a respondent, who is a counterclaimant? Absolutely. So the the text and the rules and the law are have definitions for for all of these people. But let's just break it down to who they are. The claimant is the person who initiates the proceedings um, in in front of the the CCB, and the respondent is the person against whom the proceedings are brought. Right now. Uh, there are certain types of claims that the claimant can bring, and I think we'll talk about uh, what those are a little bit later. But you can imagine that if you are the creator uh, bringing a, a claim of copyright infringement, then you would uh, serve the respondent. Um, the respondent um, can, in their response, uh, become a counterclaimant. And at that point, they then have received the information of the claim and they are going to make a permissible counterclaim. Now, when I say things like permissible, all of these things are going to be outlined uh, in the materials, uh, both put out by the Copyright Office and Copyright Alliance and ASMP, a little plug in there. The, the one other, the one other uh, subject I wanted to broach here would, is the statute of limitations. So in general, in, in copyright law in general, uh, you have three years after the claim accrues, and that's the time period uh, to bring your claim in front of the Copyright Claims Board. Now, there is a, a section uh, in the law about uh, tolling, uh, which is tolling means stopping the, uh, the, the clock on the statute of limitations claim during the period that the claim is in front of the Copyright Claims Board. There's some rules about that um, that we probably won't get to go into today. But when we talk about statute of limitations, I want you to really be thinking about that three-year time frame from when the claim accrues. All right, thanks, Tom. Uh, David, back to you. Let's talk about the type of claims that can be brought before the CC, but also what type of claims cannot be brought before the CCB. Oh, I think you're on mute again. Sorry, three types of claims can come before the board. First of all, a claim for copyright infringement. That's a pretty simple one to understand, I think. 
Second, a claim seeking a declaration that you have not infringed a copyright. So if Keith is about to release a book and Terika has asserted that that book infringes her copyright, uh, Keith, uh, who might be a little bit worried about releasing that book in the face of an infringement for copyright, can come to us and ask uh, for us to rule that no, he did not infringe it. And there are all sorts of circumstances where that might actually be a very useful tool for someone who's been accused of copyright. So one thing I want to make clear is the CCB is not just for copyright owners. It's not just for people who have a claim of infringement. It's for everyone. Uh, and we hope we find people coming from all sides of the issue uh, to get rulings from us. Finally, you can get a claim for misrepresentation in a takedown notice or counter notification under the DMCA. Some of you may not know what that is, and it's sort of a detailed thing, but basically you can send a takedown notice to certain plat online platforms like YouTube or Facebook uh, who have posted material or who rather are making available material that's been posted by their users. And if you send a takedown notice, their law gives them all sorts of incentives to take it down. Uh, on the other hand, the person who posted it may not agree and may send them a counter notification and the law gives them all sorts of incentives then to put it back up. Um, because of that, the law also provides that if someone makes a representation in either one of those takedown notices or one of those counter notifications, then the person who was at the, not at the receiving end, but the person who suffered because of that, if you, if you took my material, had my material taken down because you claimed it was infringing and it wasn't, and it was because I made misrepresentation. You made misrepresentations. I might be able to get a claim for damages against you for the harm caused by that. That's a Section 512F misrepresentation claim. Those are the three kinds of claims you can bring, and that's it. I mean, what can't you bring? Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, no, that's that's exactly right. If you didn't hear David list those a claim, like a, if you have an ownership dispute, for instance, that's it wasn't on the list that David mentioned. You can't bring those type of claims before the CCB. So. Um, and next question is for David or Whitney, whoever wants to jump in. Are there limitations as to who can be sued uh, by a claimant uh, that potential claimants should be aware of? Maybe there's certain people they can't bring before the CCB? Yes, the statute does have certain limitations. First, you can't sue the, the federal government. You can sue them in the court of federal claims if that's where all claims against the federal government are, are brought. You can't sue a state. And as many of you know, it's pretty darn hard to sue a state in court as well. Uh, we're not. We're no better a forum for that. I'm afraid. Uh, you absolutely can't sue a state uh, in, in the before the claims board. You can't sue someone who resides outside the United States unless they have sued you and you're asserting a counterclaim against them. So if someone from outside the United States uh, asked for a declaration that they were not infringing your work, you could assert a counterclaim against them for infringement of that work. But as a general proposition, you can't sue someone from outside the United States. Uh, then there are some other people who can't be sued under certain circumstances. Libraries and archives got a special provision in the Case Act, which says that a library or archive can submit a blanket opt out. Basically, and they've already started doing so. Basically, they file a piece of paper that says, I'm opting out of the Case Act, so don't bother suing me. I'm never going to come. I'm never going to show up, and I don't have to. Um, that's in contrast to what you anyone else would have to do, which is once you've been served with a claim, you can file an individual opt out in that case. So if you're going to file a suit against a library or archives, please check the out the opt out list because if they're on it, then uh, in most cases you're not going to get very far. Um, and finally, if you're still an online platform like YouTube or Facebook, based on the fact that they're making available materials that a user posted online. You can bring a claim against them, but only if you have already served them with a takedown notice and they've not complied with it or a counter notification they haven't complied with. All right, thanks, David. And I wanna point out before I go on, I noticed that Nora is from the Copyright Office is providing some very helpful kind of additional information, additional resources to supplement the, the responses of the panelists. So I encourage you to you take a look at that in the chat as well uh, while we're talking here. So uh, thank you very much for doing that, Nora. Um, uh, Whitney, uh, um, Let's talk about the claim now. So someone wants to file a claim. What needs to be included in or with a claim uh, that is filed with the CCB? Yeah, absolutely. So a claim needs all the basic facts of the dispute that would allow a respondent to consider whether or not to participate or opt out. Uh, so we need to know, this is a general overview. I know Nora's gonna drop in the chat uh, all the details that you need to get your claim ready, um, but the type of claim that you're gonna file. So what category uh, that David mentioned applies to your dispute? Uh, who you are, um, who the respondents are, uh, how to get in touch with everybody. Uh, you know, we're going to be communicating back and forth. We need to make sure we have contact information. Uh, 
the fundamentals of the copyright protected work involved in the dispute. So that is the, what type of work is it? Is it registered or not? Um, how many owners are there? Uh, who's the, uh, the claimant? Um, and the where, the when, the how of the dispute, who took what action, where, what time, to the extent known. Um, you know, we know that, you know, a lot of people are just kind of gathering information and they are in the best situation that they find themselves. Um, so, you know, we're not asking for perfection, uh, but we do need to have the information uh, sufficient that, uh, you know, we can have clear the claim, I'll talk about that in a moment, um, clear the claim, have the uh, claimant serve the respondent and have the servant, have, excuse me, have the respondent be in a position that they can weigh whether or not they'd like to participate in the CCD proceeding. Oh, I will also mention, we do ask for you to, for uh, claimants to provide what they want the CCB to do. Um, so for, uh, for an infringement or misrepresentation claim, that would be awards, uh, damages, um, for uh, the non-infringement claim, a declaration that the use is non-infringing. <clears throat> we'll also ask for some important documents, uh, things like the work, uh, websites, communications. That's optional at the uh, initiation of the claim point. Uh, we'll take care of that during, if the proceeding goes active. Uh, but know that that's something that you can get in place uh, early on when you first file your claim. All right, thank you, Whitney. I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question yeah. here. So a claimant submits a claim to the CCB, the copyright claims attorney, like yourself, needs to review and approve that claim. What does that process entail? What happens if the claimant doesn't get it right the first time? Do they have a chance to fix it? Yeah, if they absolutely. don't get it right, and how many opportunities do they get? Yeah, thank you. So yes, the copyright claims attorney reviews uh, every claim that comes into the CCB uh, for compliance. Uh, so what does compliance mean? Compliance means that the information that we have um, is, uh, you know, matches the requirements of the law and it matches the requirements of our regulations um, and that it uh, makes a, a claim, uh, essentially. Again, we're looking at how do we put the respondent in a position to determine whether or not to participate or opt out. Um, if the claim is compliant, we clear it for service and the, uh, the claimant is then has the ability to go and serve the respondent. Uh, if it's not compliant, there are multiple opportunities for the claimant to go back and fix the issues that the copyright claims attorney has identified. Uh, so uh, the claimant has two chances, really. Uh, each time the uh, copyright claims attorney issues an order of non-compliance, uh, identifying the elements that need to be fixed, and there will be 30 days uh, for the claimant to file an amended claim. Um, so we got that first chance to fix it, comes back, we do another compliance review, if it's compliant, great, serve. If not, you get another chance. You get that other chance. Uh, again, you get another order of non-compliance, elements that still need to be fixed. 30 days, get it back. The claimant said with the claimant. If it's compliant, great, serve. At that point, if it's not compliant, uh, at that point, we take it to the copyright claims officers who review it, uh, confirm that there's continuing non-compliance with the law and regulations, and then we have to dismiss the claim without prejudice. I'll note that when we say, you'll hear maybe terms saying without prejudice, with prejudice, essentially when something is dismissed without prejudice, it means that it may be refiled again before the CCB, uh, but keep in mind, uh, if you want to refile a claim uh, that has been found non-compliant, you want to make sure that you uh, get it uh, uh, square with the law and the regulations before trying again. All right, thanks, Whitney. Uh, Terika, let's talk about registration, right? Copyright registration is always a big part of uh, enforcing your copyright and a big part of the copyright, uh, copyright system. So does the work that's at issue in the claim, does it need to be registered with the copyright office before, before the claimant files a claim and what should the claimant do if they haven't registered yet and they want to file a claim? Those are great, great, great questions. Um, so in order to file a claim for copyright infringement specifically before the CCB, the claimant must first file a registra registration application with the Copyright Office for the works at issue. So you can only file a claim for infringement if you have a pending registration application on file with the Copyright Office or the Copyright Office has already approved the registration application and granted a registration certificate. So if someone wants to bring an infringement claim but hasn't yet registered their work with the Copyright Office, they can go ahead and submit a registration application as soon as possible. And once they do that, they'll be able to file their claim with the CCB. 
Now, the caveat there is that the CCB judges will not be able to issue a final decision in the case until the registration is approved and a registration certificate has been granted. So if a claimant wants to speed that process up, they can pay to have their registration application expedited and the office will do its best job to complete the review of the registration application within 10 business days. Um, in order to expedite a registration application, the claimant needs to submit a request to the CCB and pay the filing fee, which is $50. But one uh, important thing to keep in mind about this is that the claimant can only request uh, an expedited registration after the claim becomes active. So in other words, they have to first give the respondent the full 60 days to opt out if the respondent does not opt out, the claim, the case becomes active and then the claimant can request the expedited registration. All right, thanks, Derica. So, so Tom, I'm gonna to call on you to kind of segue us to the next section of, next part of the CCB process. So the claim has been approved by the copyright claims attorney. Then what does the claimant do? Like, what's the next step? How does the claimant notify the respondent that, hey, I've got a claim against you, right? Um, and presumably it's some type of notice. And so what are, what are the elements of a proper notice uh, to the respondent? Yeah, so once, once it's been approved, once uh, you're, you're ready to notify the other side, uh, the claim is compliant, uh, you have 90 days to serve the claim. And you're gonna hear that term service. And there's really two types of, of service that I wanna discuss. One is with serving individuals, right? Um, the rules that, that govern process of service uh, can vary from state to state. This is another place where the CCB handbook and all the additional materials are gonna be incredibly helpful for you to determine uh, how, to, how to serve your claim once it's been uh, confirmed and approved. Um, the, the individuals are, are one matter, but there's business entities as well. And there's a few specific things that you do want to keep in mind if you're going to, uh, be serving, uh, your claim on business entities. There's a database that the CCB has, uh, has created for designated service agents for businesses. Now, if you're familiar uh, with DMCA rules and, and the kind of designated agents for that, this is a separate, this is a separate database, okay? And businesses can opt to put a particular person uh, to be served in this database. Now, if the, the, the respondent, if the person you're serving the claim upon uh, is a business and has put their information in that database, then you absolutely have to follow that instruction and send your claim to that person. Now, that can be um, uh, done by mail, of course, but the designated service agent can also elect to accept claims by email, and that will be noted in the database that the CCB has. Um, uh, if they are not listed there, then you would proceed like you would with an individual, which is serving the claim uh, by mail under the particular steps that are required in the state um, that is relevant. Um, there's also a concept of waiver of service. And you can ask the respondent to waive service uh, by using a form that the CCB is going to provide. And that means that they've agreed to receive the claim without having been served according to the formal rules. Now, importantly, it does not mean that they've waived their right to opt out. Okay. This just means that they have waived formal service and are receiving the claim. Uh, the respondent can choose to waive service uh, because doing so gives them an extra 30 days uh, to respond to the claim after the proceeding has become active. All of this related to how the claimant serves the, the claim upon the respondent uh, is going to be detailed in the materials that I think, uh, that I think we're going to talk about a little bit later uh, from the CCB. All right, thanks, Tom. So let's, let's talk about, we've we filed the case now, we've kind of uh, no notified the respondent about the case. What does the respondent do? Well, the respondent has a decision to make, right? Do they opt out or do they participate in the case? Um, so first off, I guess for Whitney is, how does, how does the claimant know who to serve? 
Sure. So the claimant is going to serve depending on, on who the respondent is. Uh, so there's a couple, it's like a kind of a bit of a decision tree uh, that the claimant has to go through. Um, as Tom mentioned, uh, when we clear the claim for service, we're going to provide a packet of materials uh, for the claimant to provide uh, to the respondent. Um, you kind of, again, you make that decision about service sort of when you file your claim by identifying who the claimant is. Um, if the respondent is an individual, the claimant will generally serve that individual. Um, if the respondent is a business, the claimant should first check that designated service agent directory. Um, this directory, it provides that eligible uh, businesses can designate an agent. Uh, when they designate an agent, that's the way that you have to serve. Uh, but there are advantages, right? Uh, a designated agent uh, indicates uh, that they can be served by mail and may also be served by email. That's an option. Uh, so a claimant uh, who has a case against a, uh, a respondent in the, in the directory means that you will serve by mail or by optional email. And if the respondent is unknown, you have to take a step. Um, if you don't know who your respondent is, your claim cannot go beyond compliance review. Uh, so if you don't know who your respondent is and the infringement is involves online content, uh, you might want to consider what's known as a 512H subpoena. Uh, this is a way to go to an online service provider to provide the to, to get the identity um, of a potential infringer. Now, this is a process that is a but it's a it's a bit involved involves the federal courts. Um, we're going to have some set instructions available online uh, to help claimants identify who the respondent is through this subpoena process. So really, you know, we think of service as like a moment that happens uh, when you have a process server or somebody, you know, take these papers, deliver it to a respondent. But really, you're kind of thinking about service back when you file your claim uh, and when you're considering who your respondent is. And you'll kind of give us some information related to serving your claim at that time. Okay, thanks, Whitney. So I'm gonna go back to Tom here to ask him if, if you're a respondent um, and you, uh, you want to litigate the case, in other words, you don't want to opt out, what do you do? Well, this one's, this one's pretty straightforward. Uh, if respondent doesn't opt out, then the case proceeds. Um, if you don't opt out of the proceeding, the case becomes active and the CCB will then uh, provide you additional materials, including a scheduling order, which is going to set forth the next step. So uh, very straightforward. If, if you receive a, a claim and, and you don't uh, wish to opt out, then, uh, then you will, um, uh, the proceeding is going to become active and you're going to get more information, including that scheduling order. All right, so then we, we're going to go to David. So what happens if the opposite is true? If the respondent wants to opt out, what does the respondent do? Can they just like pick up the phone and call the copyright office and say, hey, opt me out, or maybe just send an email to the copyright office? Or is there a more formal procedure for opting out? It's, it's not quite that easy, but it's almost that easy. Um, if you're served with initial notice of the claim, it will tell you about the CCB and how a proceeding works. And it will also tell you a little bit about the opt-out option, a little bit about the pros and cons, and most importantly, how, well, maybe not most importantly, but most importantly in response to this question, how you can opt out. Uh, there are two ways to do that. First of all, you can go online, which is the recommended way. The notice will tell you exactly how to do that. You just have to fill in some very basic information. You have to find your case name and number on, the, on a list that'll be, that will pop up. Uh, you have to file some basic information about yourself. Uh, you have to provide a, uh, what, a, a particular key code that is going to be included with your initial notice, just so that when someone goes in to opt out of a claim, we're actually sure it's actually them because they've got the key code and not everyone else on earth has it. Um, you have to sign, which means really when you're doing it on a computer, you just have to type your name in on the signature line. That's a valid signature under the law. Um, and, uh, and you're done. Uh, you'll get an email confirmation almost instantaneously. That's why we recommend it. You can get on, go on there online. You can do it right away. You'll get an instantaneous email response. Nothing could be easier. But you can also use a paper form that we're going to include with everything that's served on you. Uh, it asks for all the information that you're asked to do online. Uh, you simply fill that out, sign it, and send it back to us in the mail. 
that's all got to be done uh, within the 90 day period, which means you have to drop it in the mail or give it to like a FedEx or, or a, a carrier like that, uh, no later than 90 days after, um, and you're done. You, uh, you'll get a confirmation uh, by mail, I think with a paper opt-out. Is that right, Whitney? I'm trying to remember now whether we ended up with that. Um, confirmation is uh, generally by email. Um, we do have some provisions in place uh, when we know that people uh, have restricted access to technology. Um, so we do try to provide the quickest confirmation, uh, but we do also recognize when people come in um, with uh, limited access to technology. And so we have procedures in place for that as well. All right, great. Uh, so Tom, going back to you, what happens if a respondent opts out within the deadline? What happens if they do not opt out? Yeah, so if you opt out, then the CCB will dismiss the claim against you. But of course, very importantly, the claimant can still bring that claim in federal court. And that's part of the incentive to, to stay with the program. Um, in addition to the notification that you get from the claimant, the CCB will, will send a separate notification if you've not yet opted out uh, to make sure that you've received a copy of the claim and know what the opt-out period is and, and the other information that was discussed. Um, and so uh, if, and as we discussed earlier, what happens if a respondent does not opt out? Well, very simply, the, the claim becomes active because at that point to, to get to the point where the respondent has received the claim and it's already been um, it's already been uh, confirmed by the, the CCA, the, the attorney over there um, at the Copyright Claims Board. All right. Uh, so we've talked a lot about opting out, not opting out. Um, let's talk a little bit about the decision-making process. Terika, maybe you can help us out here. Why would someone decide to opt out or maybe decide not to opt out? Like what, 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 what factors might go into that decision? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I'll take the question of why might someone decide to opt out first and then why would, might someone not opt out? Um, so someone might decide to opt out, frankly, because, you know, maybe they feel like the claim that's being brought against them is a frivolous claim and doesn't have any basis. Um, or alternatively, they could opt out for any reason. If they just don't want to participate in that particular uh, case, they can choose to just opt out of that proceeding. Um, but I think the more, uh, I, th I think the question that many of the people in attendance today, um, and frankly, a lot of people that I've heard from have, that's the bigger question is why would someone choose to participate in a process that's voluntary? Why would they not just opt out? Um, and, you know, I think the biggest reason why someone might choose to participate rather than opt out is because of the significant limited liability um, at the CCB as compared to federal court. So, if someone you know, has a claim that's brought against them and they look into the circumstances and realize, you know, hey, I actually did infringe this work or you know, I didn't realize it at the time, um, but you know, I have violated that person's rights. Um, the significance of limited liability at the CCB, which is maximum $30,000 uh, compared to federal court where there are no limits at all. Um, and then per claim of infringement, there's a $15,000 cap uh, at the CCB compared to a federal court, which is $150,000. Um, if you assess uh, the facts of the situation and realize that you actually might be liable for what you're being accused of, it could make sense for you to actually choose to go before the CCB rather than take your chances of ending up in federal court. Not only is there limited liability, but the process is significantly simplified such that you can represent yourself so you don't have to take on that additional cost of having to hire an attorney that you would likely need in federal court. Um, and you know, we mentioned before that this process is entirely voluntary, both for the claimant and the respondent. And there, although it is very expensive to litigate a case in federal court, it doesn't mean that every person who has a claim and brings a claim to the CCB can't afford federal court. So again, because the process is so simplified, because there is such a cost savings, there likely will be people who choose to bring a case before the CCB who actually could afford to go to federal court, but due to the particular circumstances of this case, may choose to bring that case to the CCB. So just because you are a potential respondent who has a claim brought against you um, at the CCB doesn't mean that that person can't afford to go to federal court. And so I think it's important to kind of weigh out uh, the claim that's being brought against you, weigh out your potential liability and really think about the fact that this person 
could afford to go to federal court potentially. And if that is the case, you would be opening yourself up to significantly more liability than if you just go with the case in the CCB. All right, thanks, Terika. So we've talked about filing a case. We've talked about what the respondent does when they know they, they find out that this is a case against them. We have even talked about what the, the real big part of this, right? Which is what happens when you have an active proceeding. That's really the the biggest part of this. And we're gonna dive into that now, but, but before we do, we've got these kind of, like I said, speed dating questions because we wanna make sure you understand when we use terms, we wanna make sure you understand what terms we're using here. So I'm gonna call on Whitney here to, uh, to talk a little bit about discovery. What, what is discovery? And in the process of discovery, there are terms like interrogatories, requests for admissions, request for product, production of documents, you know, very kind of legalese terms, perhaps. Um, maybe you can explain what those are because we're going to talk a little bit about those. So yes, absolutely. So uh, just to kind of orient us, uh, you know, we've got the, the claim, compliance, service. Now we're at that active, active proceeding. And as Thomas mentioned, uh, we're going to issue that scheduling order. And the scheduling order sets forth what we're going to see in the active proceedings phase. And um, you know, we kind of think about it, we have discovery, we have conferences, uh, we have written testimony, we might have a hearing and a determination. Those are kind of the big chunks. Uh, but let's focus on sort of one of the technical uh, terms, discovery. So discovery is the process of sharing information between parties about the evidence involved in the proceedings. Uh, this information includes documents, images, objects, or responses to formal questions. Um, we uh, have uh, certain things, elements of, of discovery within a proceeding that allows people to exchange information um, in a structured way. Um, so know that uh, when parties are in an active proceeding, uh, we'll be giving standard forms, standard questions, standard requests uh, to both of the parties to kind of take the mystery and some of the complexity out of this discovery or information sharing process. So just to highlight some of the technical terms that you might hear. Uh, there's interrogatories. Uh, this, these are formal questions that asks uh, the other party about information related to the proceedings. This is the, the who, the what, where, when, and why of a particular proceeding. Uh, the second thing is a request for admission. This set plays a big role in federal courts. Uh, this is asking the other side to admit a certain fact or point or position. In the CCB, this is very limited. Um, we only allow them when the parties really need them. Uh, but the other big part, so we have interrogatories, which is a term that you'll hear when you're involved with a CCB proceeding, uh, but then the request for production of documents. This is a standard list of asking the other side, hello, I need any document that you're going to rely on, ones that you find important to your case and ones that might be important to mine. Um, again, when we're thinking about these terms, you're not going to be alone. Um, we are going to be giving you standard lists, standard explanations, uh, and we're going to make sure that we have conferences at the beginning of this process to make sure that everyone understands some of these terms that I've just talked about. Okay, thanks, Whitney. Uh, David, so let's say the window is passed, the respondent has not opted out. What happens next? Well, what happens next is first the claimant has to pay the remainder of the filing fee. Thomas uh, alluded to the fact that we have a two-tiered filing fee. That was something we did after we got a lot of pushback to our initial notice proposed rulemaking. So the, the filing fee remains at $100, but it's just $40 upfront. If the respondent does not opt out, in other words, if you have an active proceeding, then you have to pay the balance of that $100 fee, the additional $60. So that's the next step. We don't go forward till we have that, the second installment, shall we say, on the filing fee. Um, once that happens, then all parties who have not yet registered for the ECCB, our Electronic Copyright Claims Board, our online filing system, will have to register because almost all papers are filed and served through the ECCB. I mean, one of the wonderful things about the ECCB is, unlike in federal court where you have to serve papers on parties, although I guess maybe with paper, that's not necessarily the case anymore, but in, in any event, Everything basically is served by us. You file it with us, it gets served on the other party. Um, and once that happens, there'll be a scheduling order issued. And I think Whitney mentioned that. And I think Tom maybe even mentioned it earlier as well, which will have deadlines for all the major steps in the case. And the first deadline is going to be for the respondent to file a response to the claim. We've talked a lot about the claim. 
we've also got a response for those of you who know what federal court works like it's the same thing as the answer just like the claim is the same thing as the complaint in federal court so it's where you have a chance to admit or deny what the claimant alleges and to say why you think if assuming you do think and you probably do or you wouldn't be filing it what why you think the claimant shouldn't win uh assert any defenses you may have and so forth okay so terica i'm going to have you pick up the ball from there so after the scheduling is or order is issued uh, the respondent then has a chance to respond to the claim. How much time does the respondent have to file to, to file their response? And how might the respondent uh, respond? Yeah, so the deadline as far as when uh, the response is due will actually be set by the scheduling order that will be issued by the CCB. So um, it's important to pay attention to the dates and deadlines that are articulated there. Um, and as far as how might they respond, um, one way that they can respond is to assert different def defenses uh, to the claim that's being brought against them. So a respondent can raise any of the defenses available under the Copyright Act. So one of the most you know, known uh, of those defenses is fair use. They can bring a fair use defense uh, or any other defense under the Copyright Act, as well as any other defense available under the law. So for example, they might raise a defense about uh, the statute of limitations. I know Tom touched on that earlier. Um, in addition, they can raise counterclaims uh, in response to the claim that's brought against them. Um, but the counterclaim must be related to the claim, uh, the initial claim in one of two ways. It must either be an infringement claim or a claim of misrepresentation under section 512F and arise under the same event or set of circumstances that gave rise to the original claim or if the original claim is itself a copyright infringement claim, the respondent can bring a counterclaim related to some sort of contract or agreement uh, pertaining to that infringement claim. So those are uh, two of the ways that a respondent can respond to a claim against them. Okay, thanks, Terika. So once the respondent responds, the claimant then has a res opportunity perhaps to respond to any counterclaims by the respondent. So we're not gonna get into too much detail there, but then we jump in discovery and you already talked quite a bit about this right discovery can be pretty elaborate and pretty complex in federal court certainly can you discuss a little bit maybe to touch i don't know if there's anything else you want to touch upon that you haven't already to discuss the discovery process at the ccb and how it differs from discovery in federal court you already touched a little bit upon this but maybe there's anything something you want to add here Sure. Uh, so, you know, I actually saw um, a, a question in the chat about depositions, uh, and this is actually a, a good point to make about um, discovery between uh, the federal court and the CCB, uh, is that there are just some elements uh, that's contained in the, in the federal court that are uh, complex, um, exhausting, and costly. That just won't be with the CCB. And one of the main things that we will not be having is depositions. Um, so depositions, um, as I mentioned, requests for admissions are limited to cases where they're really needed. Um, it's the same thing with expert witnesses. Um, we are going to be weighing very carefully uh, when parties ask for e expert witnesses, um, weighing those uh, requests very, very carefully. Um, so when we're looking at discovery, and we're comparing it to federal court, uh, we're looking at uh, a little bit more of uh, handholding and involvement from the CCB. So, um, you know, federal court uh, discovery is handled mainly by the parties outside of the view of the court. Uh, handling uh, the CCB uh, discovery process, um, not just with the beginning conferences before the discovery period begins, but also with those standard sets of interrogatories and requests for production of documents, means that uh, the process is not um, is a little is much more circumscribed uh, throughout this CCB proceeding. <clears throat> um, and I'll also note, you know, we've talked about sort of the main track for a CCB proceeding, uh, but the office will also uh, provide a smaller claims track. Uh, so this is for, or what's sometimes known as microclaims. Uh, so for uh, people with a certain level of damages, they can select a smaller claims proceeding, which is even more stripped down than a main small claims proceeding. And in a smaller claims proceeding, uh, we're not even looking at sort of a standard discovery process. We're looking at an initial uh, conference with a CCB officer, and the CCB officer really discusses with the parties what information is actually needed uh, for uh, each party to sort of make their case before the CCB. 
uh, from that, the officer will provide further direction about discovery. Uh, but there, it's really narrow, further, more narrowly tailoring discovery to just the elements that are needed for the proceeding. Um, so that's really the two big, the big difference between federal courts and uh, smaller claim and the CCB uh, is that it's less complex. Uh, it is more standardized. And with the smaller claims proceeding, it even has the opportunity, opportunity to be more narrowly tailored to the proceeding at hand. All right, um, David, Whitney talked a lot about discovery and, and, this, and, and you touched upon and others touched upon the scheduling order and there are deadlines in there, right? And so what happens if a party misses a deadline? Uh, is the case dismissed? And for that matter, just aside from deadlines, can the case be dismissed for other reasons beyond just missing deadlines? Yes. Uh, well, those of you who have, the have had the pleasure of being in federal court know that deadlines are very important and you definitely don't want to miss a deadline. It can mean the end of the case for you, depending on what the deadline is and how you deal with it. But um, we have similar rules in the CCB, but I think they're a bit more forgiving. We recognize that uh, probably most people before aren't going to have attorneys that maybe their first encounter with the legal system. So uh, this isn't a game of gotcha. Uh, we really want to make rulings on the merits and not because someone missed a deadline. So uh, nevertheless, we have rules. And if you miss a deadline, uh, a party, the other party may ask or we may decide on our own that uh, this leads to what is called a default. A default is where you didn't do what you were supposed to do. And therefore, uh, the case may be dismissed. But it's not going to be instantaneously. We will send you a notice. We'll send you a follow-up notice. We'll do everything we can to get you back in the case. Um, if you don't come back in, if you, you, know, if, if you just ignore it, then uh, we'll issue a, uh, a proposed ruling. We'll ask, to, if you're the respondent, for example, we'll ask the claimant to sort of make, basically present their case, make their case for us, explain to us why they ought to win the case. Uh, we'll do a proposed, if, if we think it makes sense, if we, if we think, yeah, they've made their case, we'll give the respondent one more chance to respond and say, hey, here it is last chance to tell us why they're wrong. If they don't do it, then we'll issue a default determination. If they do it, we'll give the plaintiff, uh, the claimant a chance to respond one more time and we'll ultimately make our ruling. Um, so there are, there, there's plenty of process here. Some people might think too many process, but the basic notion is that we really do want to get to a merits ruling and to a certain degree, we're going to bend over backwards to give you the chance to explain to us your side of the case. But, uh, you know, don't, don't, uh, <laughs> Don't, try, don't, don't test the system too much or you may find that our patience is worn out. We basically allow people to miss a couple of deadlines and go through this process. And after that, all bets are off. Um, Keith uh, asked whether there are other ways in which we might dismiss a case. Well, there is something in the statute which is called dismissal for unsuitability. And unsuitability is defined in the statute as including any of the following, but it says including, so it's not limited to the following. Uh, the failure to join a necessary party, that's a doctrine I'm not going to try to explain to you right now, but basically there are certain people who in a case just have to be in the case or the case can't go forward. Uh, second, the lack of an essential witness, evidence, or expert testimony. Uh, one example would be we can't issue subpoenas. So if there's a witness out there whose testimony is absolutely crucial, we can't really figure out what happened without that witness. We may end up saying, and you can't get them to show up, we may end up saying, look, this case is not suitable for determination by us because there's this key witness out there. We can't get this person in front of us. Uh, this is gonna have to go to federal court. That might, that might be one scenario. Uh, uh, finally, the determination of a relevant issue of law or fact that could exceed either the number of proceedings we could reasonably administer or the subject matter competence of the CCB. Um, Made to be seen whether we're going to get so many claims that we have to start doing that. And, and it's hard to figure out how we'd actually figure out, all right, this one's in and that one's out. But at least that's in there to give us some, uh, some wiggle room. And, and then again, unsuitability, as I said, it, it's a term that is not defined to its completion. So it may well be that in the course of a proceeding, we may find some other reason why a case just isn't suitable uh, for us. Uh, I mean, to give you an example that'll never happen, if Oracle versus Google were filed before the Copyright Claims Board, I think we would have said at the very outset, uh, uh, unsuitable for us. There are some cases that just aren't suitable for the claim board. And I think everyone recognizes that. All right, ex ex excellent point there. Um, so let's move on to remedies and talk about remedies. Um, Tom, maybe you can talk about what type of remedies are available. For instance, we talked about injunctions, the fact that injunctions aren't available. 
Uh, maybe when does somebody choose? We have statutory damages and actual damages. When does somebody elect which type of damages they get? What about attorney's fees and other costs? Um, can yeah. you talk a little bit about remedies? Sure. So let's start with, with monetary relief and as monetary relief. And as you've heard a few times, the the limit for a proceeding is thirty thousand dollars in any one proceeding, no matter how many claims or or copyrightable works are are at issue. When we look at monetary damages, we look at the same types of damages uh, in federal court, meaning we have actual damages and the respondent's profits or statutory damages. Well, actual damages are obviously those that uh, you can prove. Um, the actual damages and profits are the amount that you can prove to the, the CCB. Uh, but statutory damages don't require that proof. Now, statutory damages have limitations, uh, additional limitations in the CCB. Um, and so even though the cap on any one proceeding is $30,000, the cap on statutory damages for uh, for work is $15,000. So uh, realize that if you have more than uh, a few works uh, and you're seeking statutory damages, then uh, you may run up against that $30,000 cap. And, and that brings up that idea that has been talked about a few times. Maybe some cases aren't designed either on, on either side for uh, for the CCB, if you if you find that there's so many works and they all uh, you're seeking statutory damages on all those works, then uh, those caps may come into play. Um, if you don't have your works registered timely, the statutory damage caps actually go down to uh, fifteen thousand dollars per proceeding and seventy five hundred dollars per work. So uh, you know, even though we have these great provisions in there about uh, about registration, uh, you really need to make sure you get those works registered timely under the current registration uh, provisions that are in section 412. Um, now, you mentioned infringements, Keith, uh, I'm sorry, injunctions. And the CCB can't issue orders that require the infringer to stop infringing. Uh, there's an interesting provision that says that if the parties agree that uh, one side is going to stop infringing, then that agreement can be reflected in the final determination. Um, and that agreement, you could make that agreement with uh, the other party uh, without admitting wrongdoing at some point, uh, and then that can be incorporated. Uh, attorney's fees are the last piece. And ordinarily, attorney's fees are not uh, the, the, the claimant, the successful claimant or successful respondent are not reimbursed for the cost for participating in the proceeding or hiring an attorney, but the CCB does have discretion. Uh, if a party operates in bad faith or, or acted, acts dishonestly or is misleading, then the CCB can order that party to pay the other party's reasonable costs and attorney's fees with a cap. So the cap on that, if you have an attorney, is $5,000 for those reasonable costs and fees. And obviously, that's a cap, so it could be lower. Uh, but if you are not represented by an attorney, then that cap is at $2,500 uh, for your reasonable costs. Uh, there's also a provision that allows the CCB in extraordinary circumstances, you know, if there's a, a practice or pattern of, of bad faith activity, uh, to increase those amounts. But I think the thing to be thinking of there is that uh, ordinarily absent any of those bad faith uh, exceptions, the successful party is not reimbursed for the cost uh, and attorney's fees. Um, and, and again, I'll, you know, I'll go back to the idea that uh, this body was designed for uh, individuals to be able to bring their claims without uh, having to, to hire an attorney to pursue them. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, David, let me turn to you. So we've kind of, let's assume we've gone through this process and uh, you've reached a decision, the CCB, not you in particular, although I guess with a micro claims case, it could be, we'd be only one officer involved. But uh, so how do the CCB officers reach a decision in the case? Are your decisions precedential? How will the officers deal with uh, questions that involve a circuit split? Like you, you have a so circuit court out in California have one view and maybe the ones in New York have a different view or something like that. How do you, how do you deal with all that? Well, uh, first of all, we review the evidence, including testimony from the parties and witnesses, the statements from the parties, um, documents that have been submitted. Uh, if there's a hearing, what was said at the hearing. 
uh, the first thing we have to do is figure out what the facts are. Um, uh, and we rely largely on the party, almost entirely on the party, to present those facts to us. We'll do our best to elicit the facts from them, but uh, ultimately it's their job to do that. Once we figure out the facts, uh, we got a pretty good handle on copyright law as it is, but we'll certainly do the research we need to do, and we'll listen to the arguments that the people make to us, and then we'll sort of we'll apply the facts to the law like any judge or group of judges do. Um, now, how do we reach a decision? We haven't had to yet, and it'll be quite a few months before we have to, but we've got some experience working collaboratively ever since all three of us were on board as of last September, just in terms of making you know recommendations on the regulations and so on. And I got to say, you know, we, we're all strong-willed people who uh, have our own views on things, and we learned how to compromise, uh, which isn't to say we have lots of differences of opinion, but sometimes we do. And I think, I think what we've been doing in the last several months is good practice for a three-person body that has to make decisions to sort of figure out how we're going to make decisions together. And we, we actually work together very well. Um, so uh, I, I'm very optimistic that, you know, you're not going to have a whole lot of dissent. You may not have any dissent. Who knows? I mean, it, it, the fact that two of us may go one way and one may go the other way doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be a dissent written. Um, so we'll see about that. With respect to, with respect to precedential value, uh, some of you may not know, but uh, we have what is called a common law legal system, which means that when a court makes a decision, that decision is uh, it's sort of bound by that decision subsequently. When a higher court makes a decision, lower courts are bound by it from that time forward. It's, uh, the CASE Act says specifically that our decisions are not precedential. They're clearly not precedential to anyone else. Um, so, you know, if, if you like a decision you make, you can try to cite it to another court and the court may or may not pay attention to it, but they certainly don't have to. Uh, we don't even have to pay attention to it, but I've got to tell you that, um, it's hard to think that we're not going to be paying attention to what we did last time around, next time around. If we got, if we got the same facts and we're applying the same law, chances are we're going to come up with the same result just because just out of self-respect, we don't want to be doing going this way in one, in one case and that way in another case with the same facts. But Keith, you did mention a particular provision in the statute, which says that we have to, we have to um, apply the law that would have been applied in the court in which the case could have been filed. Uh, most of you probably don't know, the U.S. courts are brought, divided up into 12 regional circuits around the country. Each circuit is, has, has a particular court of appeals. Those courts sort of lay down the law. So when there are questions of how you interpret the Copyright Act, it happens that different circuits have different rules on how to apply the law. A, a very no, notable one would have been one that was decided in the fourth estate case a few years ago. In some parts of the country, the registration requirement is a prerequisite to suit meant that the Copyright Office actually had to act on your registration before you could file. In other circuits, uh, it just meant you had to go file your application. And once you did that, you could go forward. The Supreme Court finally settled that and said, no, the Copyright Office has to have acted on your registration before you could go. But up until that time, in California, you could have filed right away. In Denver, you had, would have had to wait until after the Copyright Office ruled. There are other areas where courts are split on, 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 on issues today, and we're going to have to look at, the, at the, court, the, 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 the court in which the claim could have been brought and apply the law of that court. So we may have inconsistent decisions. Let's say this were a few years ago, and uh, we had that, that registration rule. If we had a case coming that wouldn't have been filed in California, we'd rule differently than if we had a case that would have been filed in Colorado. Uh, so we have to do a little bit of uh, jurisdictional analysis, a little bit of choice of law analysis. These are things that mean something to lawyers, probably don't mean something to any of you, but there will be times when we actually have to figure out where could this case have been filed? And if it's more than one case, we have to figure out, well, what's the case that has the most connection to this? What's, what's the court that has the most connection to this case? And then apply the law as we understand it from that part of the country. Okay, thanks, David. Um, we're getting up against our, our deadline here, so I'm going to ask a few more questions, but ask uh, folks, to, our panelists, to be a little brief if possible, so we can get through a couple questions and maybe uh, respond to a question or two that we get we got from the uh, attendees. So, Tom, uh, let's say a party uh, gets a decision, um, but the losing party fails to comply with the decision, you know, pay the damages or what have you. Um, what can a party do to enforce uh, the decision by the CCP? 
Yeah, well, real simply, if the CCB orders a respondent to pay damages and, and they fail to do so, then the claimant can ask a federal district court to take action to require payment on the CCB final determination. Uh, Terica, uh, maybe you can talk very briefly about the safeguards that are in place to prevent abuse and bad actors. I know Tom kind of alluded to this a little bit, but maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So I'll just start off by saying, you know, I think everyone who is interested in the CCB small claims process is also equally interested in making sure that it's not a process that is being subject to abuse or misuse. Um, so there are definitely safeguards in place. I think the biggest one is the fact that the process is entirely voluntary. So if for whatever reason you feel like a claim is being brought against you that is abusive or in bad faith, you can always choose to opt out of the process. Um, in addition, I think you know Tom touched on these, but there are some penalties for bad faith uh, actors and bad faith claims, including uh, potentially being subject to attorney's fees and costs, and also uh, potentially being banned from bringing additional claims to the CCB for a period of 12 months. Um, and then another uh, safeguard that's in place is that the Copyright Office has the ability to limit the number of claims that can be brought by any one claimant. Um, and then finally, I'll just touch on uh, to prevent any kind of abuse in the notice uh, service of process um, process. Uh, the notice requirements for the CCB mirror the requirements uh, for the federal rules for what has to be done to uh, serve process in federal court. But there's also an additional notice that would be provided by the copyright office just to make sure that uh, the respondent is aware of the claim against them and, and knows all the information that they need to know about their rights with regard to the CCP. Thanks, Terika. So uh, Whitney's sort of last question of the day here. Um, we've covered a lot of, I mean, a lot of ground. I'm, we were been flying through this, right? Um, uh, but hopefully people have, you know, uh, people have come along with us and they kind of understand a little bit better about how this all works. Um, but there are a lot of other resources out there, right? Because we've talked a lot and people might be going, oh, I'm confused by this or I need more information on this. So maybe uh, you can suggest some places that people can go uh, if they want additional resources or additional information about the things we talked about for today, or maybe even things we didn't touch upon today about the CCB. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so throughout this presentation, my colleague Nora uh, has been dropping in links from our website, ccb.gov. And uh, this is sort of your first stop, uh, your first stop shop, whether you are a claimant or a respondent, uh, to learn more about the CCB, the procedures and the information uh, that's needed to complete or participate in a CCB proceeding. Um, this is gonna be a growing resource. Um, we launched last month and uh, we will be rolling out more and more um, guidelines, uh, handouts, and we'll be uh, showing off the handbook, um, which is going to be um, our, you know, literal hand, book in hand. Uh, if you are in the midst of a proceeding of a CCB, uh, if you have a certain procedure, you can turn to the handbook and learn how to navigate. You can learn about the legal concepts related uh, to that procedure. Um, you can uh, learn about what you need to do uh, at a particular spot in a CCB proceeding. Um, so we are gonna be providing um, a wealth of resources. Um, there was a question to host and panelists about choice of law, particularly as it regards to fair use. Um, I'll just let you know the Copyright Office has a fair use index, which provides a summary of fair use cases across all of the circuits that David mentioned. Um, and also if you have a particular question, so right, so you're going to ccb.gov, you're going to the handbook, you're reading the general information, if you have a specific question, you can always drop us a line at asktheboard at ccb.gov. All right, thanks, Whitney. Um, I, I will add a little bit to what you said. You can also, I mean, the Copyright Office got some amazing, amazing resources. Uh, we're trying to keep up, I guess, right? Now we have our own CCB alert that we alert people what's going on at the CCB that you can sign up for. We have a CCB a guide uh, that we've been working on. There's already one kind of edition that came out before the rules came out. Um, that you can find out. We're also having the, we have something called the Copyright Academy that uh, you that, that you can um, access as well to talk about sort of one-on-one -on -one interviews with all things copyright, but we're going to be having a lot more focusing just on the CCB. So we've kind of gone over a little bit, but if you don't mind, I'm going to, we got, we got a lot of questions and we will try to answer those on our website and maybe 
maybe they, uh, the, there may be answers on the Copyright Office website as well to some of these already. But I'm going to ask David if he can just briefly answer one of those questions, which is um, if a, uh, a party is unhappy with the determination handed down by a CCB officers, is there anything they can do to appeal? I think that was one of the questions. Uh, there are three things you can do. Um, first of all, you can request that we reconsider our determination. Uh, uh, you have to prove it. That we, you have to persuade us that we made a clear error of law or fact that was material to the outcome. In other words, that we really blew it on the law or the facts, or that we made a technical mistake. Uh, if you still don't like where we are after that, you can request the Register of Copyrights, who's the head of the Copyright Office, to review our determination. You have to persuade her that we abused our discretion. Uh, now, abuse of discretion, there are all sorts of ways you can describe it. I don't think I have time to get into it, but that's a fairly deferential standard as well. And finally, if you're still unhappy, you can go to a federal district court to seek review. The grounds for that are pretty narrow. Actually, the grounds for all forms of review of us are pretty narrow. They basically track what is in the Federal Arbitration Act. In other words, if you lose at an arbitration and you want to go to a federal court to get it overturned, the law says there are certain things you have to prove that are pretty deferential because arbitration is considered a voluntary way that parties get together to determine a dispute. I think that's the philosophy behind the review of our decisions as well. You all agreed to be here. Uh, so you're going to have a pretty deferential standard such as fraud, corruption, misrepresentation, or other misconduct that we exceeded our authority or failed to render a determination. Um, those are the kinds of things you have to prove. So uh, it's pretty narrow, but there are certain avenues you can take, which I would say would be only in cases where we really blew it. Okay. Uh, and hopefully there aren't many of those cases, right, David? <laughs> oh, never, never. <laughs> never any case. All right, look, we've uh, gone over our time here. I appreciate everyone's patience with us. And hopefully you've, you've, you've learned a lot. And I really want to thank everyone who hung in with, the, with us. Uh, if you asked a question and we weren't able to answer it, we will do our best to answer it on our website, the Copyright Alliance website. So I encourage you to go to our website and, um, and check it out. Give us a week or two to, to, to respond. Um, but we'll do our best to try to respond to all the questions that, that came in here. And I want to thank each and every one of our, our panelists and our sponsors here, uh, especially our panelists did a, just an amazing job as we flew through a lot of material, uh, which was really tough. So hopefully everyone got a lot out of that. Um, and hopefully we're very much looking forward to the, 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 the CCB um, formally opening up its doors sometime in the very near future. And once again, thanks everyone uh, for participating as attendees, as panelists, and also to our sponsors. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, everyone.